So to start with, I have created one uh, short verse, shloka, on this particular event. What I am feeling now is, Saptamismin Mahakari Hyaravindasya Chashrami Sviyan Janan Punar Drishtva Sviyan Janan Punar Drishtva Modate Mana Deepyate. With this note, uh, thank you. With this note, I uh, request uh, Dr. Patrick Zait Huber uh, to present his work on linguistically mapping Ashoka, a dialectometric approach to the major rock and major pillar edicts. Over to you, Patrick. Thank you so much. Is the microphone right? Or, all right? Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. perfect. And the time, we have to stick to the time uh, limits, so 20 plus 10. Yeah, okay, oh. good. I'll try my best. Um, so thank you so much for this opportunity to present my research today here. I want to delve with you into the field of quantitative linguistics. I'm dealing with the Ashokan edicts. I guess most of you already know a thing about them. Still, I want to provide a bit of an overview before I start. So the Ashokan edicts are considered the earliest extant and decipherable evidence of written culture in South Asia. They were issued in the years after Ashoka's coronation, which is commonly dated to 268 BCE. They were not inscribed in Sanskrit, but in different language varieties of Middle Indo-Aryan or Middle Indic, uh, as well as in Greek and Aramaic. What you can see here is a map of all the edicts, and they stretch over the modern territories of India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. So it was really a very broad uh, area where they were uh, inscribed. They are, there are all in all 46 different edicts, uh, sorry, 42 different edict sites uh, in some 174 edicts in Middle Indo-Aryan uh, with distinct dialectal features. And there are three locations where you find inscriptions in Greek and or Aramaic. Most often they are categorized according to style and content and also on what they were inscribed into these categories uh, major rock edicts, minor rock edicts, major pillar edicts, minor pillar edicts, cave inscriptions, other edicts that do not fit into these categories, and the Greek and Aramaic ones. Yeah, as I've already mentioned, they show dialectal features, um, which is very telling because they are a transfer from one text into, uh, into different language varieties. And they are most likely based on some, some kind of administrative language from the eastern part of Ashoka's realm. And for short, I will call them now in this presentation just Ashoki as an umbrella term, language. In the literature, there are different kinds of classifications for these dialects. We find three, three dialects with Salomon and Obalis, four dialects with Sin, Mishra, and Misha and Ubenik. Um, they are quite consistent in their, in their grouping. Here are some differences in which sites are connected to which, uh, to which dialect. I will not go into detail in, into that right now, but you, if you're interested, you can read it up in my paper. This is very important for my research question because what I want to do is to reassess these dialect um, classifications by applying quantitative linguistics and to pre be precise the methods of dialectometry. Dialectometry is, the aim of dialectometry is to make language measurable by quantifying linguistic differences between dialects, varieties, and related languages. It was established in the 1970s, 1980s, out of a desire to reassess prevailing dialect classifications, which were often based on small sets of subjectively chosen linguistic features. Um, one of its proponents, Nerbonne, summarizes it, the advantages by stating by focusing exclusively on single features or small combinations of these variationists, including dialectologists, sometimes fail to isolate signals of provenance uh, clearly. The signals are often so complex, even misleading, that they resist analysis using simple single features methodologies. Now what dialectometry does is to use bigger data sets and to, and to examine all phenomena that can be found in these data, bigger data sets. The features are not subjectively chosen, they're not subjectively deemed to be more important or distinctive or even weighted in their importance. There are, some, there are two major schools of dialectometry, the so-called Salzburg School and the Groningen School. The Salzburg School was founded by Hans Goebel and it, 
It takes data, taxates it according to linguistic phenomena on the levels of phonetics, morphology, syntax, and lexicon. And the similarities between these taxates is then calculated with, uh, by applying different kinds of algorithms. The Groningen School is centered on John Nervon, and they predominantly lose, use the so-called Levenstein distance either in its original version or with various modifications. A taxation of the data is not necessary, but the data needs to be arranged uh, so only appropriate linguistic items can be compared. Common to both schools is that the attainment, that the attained measurements are arranged in distance or similarity matrices. Uh, they apply clustering and all, then they create aerial linguistic maps. In order to do that with the Ashokan inscriptions, I had to digitize them first. I did not work with the inscriptions directly, but I relied on text editions and publications where, they, where I could find them. I arranged them in correspondence sets and decided at first to deal with the major rock edicts and major pillar edicts. Unfortunately, I had to exclude two locations, which are Subara and Sanati, because they are just too fragmentarily attested. Then I decided to, to use all the word forms that can be found in at least 75% of these edict sites, but this is not based on any statistical reasons, but just in practicality, because if I have too many gaps in the data set, then it, get this, it gets distorted. And then the next step, so this left me with 66 word forms that are suitable for comparison. The next step was the philological and linguistic interpretation uh, this is just, I just want to give you a glimpse into the challenges I faced. One of them is that the, uh, the Ashokan inscriptions were written in different writing systems. Most of them are in Brahmi, where geminates are in, geminate consonants are indicated, but, but vowel, sorry, geminate consonants are not indicated, but vowel length is indicated. Um, Karoshti was used in the Northwest for Shabazgari and Mansehra, and here's the problem is even a bit more complicated because neither vowel length nor geminate consonants are indicated, which is of course a difficulty when you try to compare the level of phonetics phonology of these varieties with each other. And then there's also another challenge, which is that anusvara is often omitted or, in, or can be found in anatomological position. So first I had to amend the data in order to be able to have good linguistic material. This is an example of the correspondence set. Uh, in the rows, you can find the locations with certain variants of words, and uh, each cell contains all the variants for, for a certain variable, and different, if you find more than one variant, this is indicated by this vertical line as a delimiter. The Sanskrit equivalent is here just given as a reference point. It was not included in uh, the measurements. I carried out the distance measurement with the software R by using the package dialect R. It provides a function called distance matrix, which creates, uh, of course, a matrix by applying the Levenstein distance. The Levenstein distance is the number of modifications that are necessary to transform one string into the other by either insertion, deletion, or substitution. Hering appraises the Levenstein distance by saying, the Levenstein distance is completely objective and its results are verifiable, an advantage it shares with other computational methods in contrast to dialect maps based on tribes and intuition. If the data used consists of representative samples of the varieties. So it's re really very important that only cognates, which means etymologically related word forms are compared with each other. It is possible, and it's often done in computational sciences, to use the Levenstein distance to measure any kind of difference between two strings of words, but for linguistic interpretation, this is not suitable. So the philological and linguistic work has to be done really diligently first. This is a very basic uh, example of the Levenstein distance. It's the variable yata from the location of Girnar and Eragudi. Um, so in Girnar, there's the word ata, as there's the word form ata, and the Aragudi, we have atta. So to get from one to the other, what needs to happen is that the word initial y is lost or deleted, and that the long a is substituted by the short a. 
this leads to a total number of uh, to an absolute number of modifications of two. What's also possible is to set the parameters differently in dialect R in the, in, with the distance matrix function to get relative or, um, distances, which means the sum of the number of elements in a string is, ta uh, is taken and the modifications are measured in relation to that maximum number. Uh, in this case, this gives it a relative distance of 0 0.5. This is the dis distance matrix which I created then uh, of all the 13 major rock edicts and major pillar edicts. Um, it's the sum of all the distance measurements of all the 66 word forms. Um, the, and the distances are given comparing each and every location to each other here. Yes, and this, is, this step is called aggregation in the literature and it serves as uh, to to compare the the absolute not the absolute sorry to compare the sum of the distance and this is the basis this distance matrix is the basis to further process the data which is of course necessary because you cannot make very much sense out of this uh, of these numbers. What's often used for that are um, hierarchical clustering and multidimensional scaling, which I also did. So here we can find clusters. Um, I, I use two different methods in the literature. Some use the average method, the UBGMA, unweighted pair group method with arithmetic mean, or Ward's minimum variance method to the right. I could not find out why certain researchers use the one and why use the others use the other method. So I decided to just use both and compare the results. So what's very interesting about that is um, that you can see here that the distances between the branches give you clues of how related how, how, and, and how similar certain um, language varieties are. And the closer they are, the more similar they are. And of course, the, the more they're, like the further down they're on the branch, also the more similar they are. Um, what I also did is to to cluster that into three clusters for each of the dendrograms. This is indicated by the blue squares. Uh, and here, both methods show the same results. There's one cluster for Manseja and Chabascari and one for Girnar. And for the other 10 inscriptions, there's the, this cluster. Now on the level of four clusters, we find a little bit of differences here and here. The reason for that could either be uh, the method or the rather small data set, or also that the linguistic distances between these varieties are so small and so insignificant that I get different uh, clusterings. Admittedly, hierarchical clustering is rather unstable and it needs to be validated with other methods. For example, multidimensional scaling, which I also did. Uh, multidimensional scaling is a statistical technique aimed at representing very high dimensional data in a smaller number of dimensions. This is done by assigning the calculated distance values, uh, distance values points in a coordinate system, usually in either two or three dimensions. And this then yields a plot uh, according to that in these dimensions. So compared with the hierarchical clustering before, where we had this big cluster, we can also see that the same 10 varieties are very, very close to each other in, in the multidimensional scaling. The, the, the dialect of Girnar is far away from all the other varieties, and Shabazgari and Mansehra are closer to each other than to all the other varieties. Especially this result points to the validity of that method. And in the next step, I projected that onto geographical space and came up with this map of the Ashokan edicts or of the major rock and major pillar edicts. What we can see here clearly is that geographical space uh, has a relation with li linguistic distance. Because here in the Northwest, we have uh, a cluster of Shabazgari and Manseja, we have uh, a Western cluster of Girnar, and all the others can be clustered together uh, as one dialect group. Um, yes. And I also want to discuss these results with you because we have a problem 
that this wide prevalence of the Eastern Ashoki is kind of a problem because there were no speakers of that variety in the South. There were most, they, here in the North, in the North, they most likely didn't speak that way. So it remains a question why it was used so widely. On the other hand, they are some kind of geographical features because here in the Northwest, we have inscriptions, manuscripts from Gandhari from a later period, and they still show certain features which can be found in the inscriptions of, the, of Ashoka's time. Uh, so basically, the dialect classification of Saruman and Obalis, which was this classification of the three dialects, can be, conf can be affirmed. Uh, it needs to be said that the results might change with an expanded data set, which includes more word forms and linguistic phenomena. I also want to point out that I do not intend this to be a dialect map of the 3rd century BCE. For me, this is a map of the linguistic of linguistic clusters of language varieties that can be found in the Ashokan inscriptions. So what, we may, what, what I want to do in the future is to expand this data set because with 66 tokens, it's rather small. I want to also use other methods of comparison because that's necessary um, to, get, to, get, to use more word forms. And also I want to expand all of that to all the Middle Indo-Aryan Ashokan edict sites so that I get a, a map and a link and linguistic clustering of all these locations. And I think I'm on, still on time. So I want to like to thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Patrick. It was a, yeah, it was a wonderful presentation. And uh, before we move on to the next uh, demo session, the floor is open for questions. I think, is it okay? I think the most interesting part is stay a part of this, uh, of your report. So please, could you uh, a little bit specify what kind of linguistic features uh, construct these, uh, uh, right here of the dialects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I will just refer to this, correspond to this example correspondence set here. Uh, so what's very interesting uh, and what's very distinctive for the Eastern part is the change of Old Indo-Aryan, which means Sanskrit, R, R, to L. So we, instead of Raja, we, f we find Laja um, that's that's um, it's one of the most, most um, salient features. Uh, what, what's kind of everywhere is the change of Ava to O, which is typical for Middle Indo-Aryan. And then there are also some differences, for example, um, for the future tense, where sometimes we have a thing like Gatchanti or with, with, a, with a Ch, sometimes there's uh, Karshanti with retroflex, then there's kasanti or even um, a compensatory lengthening to a long a instead of kasanti, kasanti. These are some of the features. What's also very telling is, but it's not so, it's not so clearly distinctive of, of all the areas, is that the nominal, the nominative ending of a uh, visarga gets uh, becomes um, e in the eastern varieties, but o in O in, I think it was Shabazgari, but E in Mansehra, and also a different um, outcome, Z and O in Girnar. So it's not so distinctive for the reality, but these are some of the features. Also, some others are also, um, if the, the distinct nasals, uh, retroflex, dental, and so on, are retained, or if they're just merged to one nasal. And also the sibilants, of course. Uh, all the three sibilants from Sanskrit are, can only be found in these varieties, but not in the other ones. There it's everywhere S, normal dental S. I hope this answers your question a, a little bit. We have time for one more question, if anyone has. 
So okay, so uh, thank we thank, thank you so once again Patrick Zeit Luber for his wonderful work. Thank you.